Hello everyone, I'm Matthias Hasselmann and I work as software developer for Cloudstar and Data Consult, CADAP. And something that bugged me re recently is um, this question. What uh, it doesn't bug me recently, it bugs me all the time that I can't remember what kind of unit uh, some parameters have. For instance, you look this here. Um, well, will this widget have uh, will this widget look properly proper on um, on a high dif uh, resolution display? Oh, or what? Why does this spot dress as as, as its person? <laughs> if it's kilograms, maybe it's me. Um, if it's pounds, maybe Jasper will contact her. But yeah, or something more real. We have this timer. I'm timer and interval. Yeah, what is that? Is that milliseconds? Is that seconds? Well, if it's Q-Timer, you know it. But are you sure <laughs> that it's a Q-Timer? So, um, where else? Or something that was really nasty. We had some geographics API, and I constantly messed up uh, how, what parameters to pass there. Uh, is the first one the distance in which to arrange, uh, in within which range to search, or is it the second one? So, is the time of two and a half seconds, or is it five seconds? Do I search in a range of 200 meters, or <laughs> maybe whole uh, the entire range of Europe? I don't know. <laughs> That's actually the real example that got me to this talk. <laughs> so, uh, well, this is well, fun is the thing, things, but if you mess it up, such things also can happen. It's just an Arian rocket which exploded because the engineers, some engineers were from UK and others from the continent and meters versus inches and so on. <laughs> well, how is that problem solved usually? Uh, something that's very common is you just encode the unit in your method name. As when you start with the API, you still are enthusiastic and really do it for each method. <laughs> After a while, you maybe resource to the lowest, uh, to the most precise resolution and only offer the nanosecond thing, and, uh, which is ugly to use. I don't really want to use, I want to write uh, 15 million or something just to wait for one half a second. It's ugly. So, one thing that people then start to use is one experiment I found, uh, that's pretty much known as boost units, where the authors started to use operator overloading and fancy types to express reasonable units and then you can multiply and really get areas and or forces and it's actually nice but well operator overloading custom types it always also gets into your way or if you want to extend it you have to write real template for it. it's <laughs> it's nice for demonstration <laughs> so so and uh, but luckily we now have C++ 11 which introduced a new feature user-defined uh, literals. And what you can do there is, for instance, co define complex numbers in the most natural way you could do. You just add the real part and the imaginary part and write it like that. Or you don't have to write uh, customer, or you just uh, combine uh, distances. Or, for instance, if you want to do translations, you don't have to introduce uh, weird functions. You can just say that is, that is a translatable string. Well, one limitation is that you only can suffixes for this, and it's okay. We are used to that. The other, another uh, limitation is that you must use an underscore for your prefix uh, for your custom <coughs> units. That's simply because the uh, standard committee wants to reserve, uh, reserve uh, the room that they still introduce new standard letters. For instance, you already know the L and the F and so on, and they still want to have literals without underscore for their own purposes. So you have to do the underscore. Well, and now the question, how do I do that? How do I define this custom literals? And there are three, three, ty uh, three types of user-defined literals. So the easiest one is a string literal. You just define, uh, uh, you just use a special syntax. You return your special you usually define a special type you want to convert to, because, for instance, it's a queue string or it's a time span or a queue date, which is the target type. And then you pass in a string and get the length, and then you can uh, 
transform the path. For instance, you could uh, pass it to Q-string from UTF-8 and have a quite native encoding for UTF-8 strings. So that's the easy one. Then another nice one, I've shown you the numbers. And they use cooked literals. They are quite easy to implement because the uh, compiler is doing the number parsing for you. It also comes at some limitations. For instance, you only uh, you have to implement them for unsigned numbers, and if you want to support signs, you also have to provide an operator overload to implement the minus sign. And yeah, the types are quite limited, which you can use there. So it's for uns for for integers, you use an unsigned long for floating point numbers you use a double and you actually have to do some type checks to figure out if it's really of the size you accept as you so, so you, are have, uh, you are doing C++ 11 you would put static asserts there or such well and now the real fun comes these are raw literals in raw literals you can encode uh, trivial stuff like binary numbers or even dates but pass the entire string at runtime. So you are entirely free to do whatever you want. Uh, an example I really like is the date example, where we write a date in a quite natural way. You don't have to remember if it's an American date format, is a year at the end, is a date year at the beginning. It's written there. It's so, and um, there you again have two possibilities. You can pass them at runtime by defining the simple function. It's probably nice for prototyping and figuring out if the literal function uh, is functional, but what you really want to have uh, uh, is a second version uh, which uses templates, a variadic templates, because this uh, literals then are passed at uh, compile time. To implement a thing, you just use a typical recursion pattern you use for variadic templates. You have a starting point uh, um, uh, and I have to explain it from bottom to up. You define the operator, call your helper function uh, to parse it. That's the initial value. These are the characters still passed. So you start with zero. Then you uh, just takes a then it just takes the next value of the string, add it, and uh, go on. And as soon as you don't have any strings anymore, this template is matching and it's preferred over, over all others, so the, so, so the recursion ends. You have to get used to it after that is, it's a common pattern. So, so you can have them efficiently. Another thing you have to take care about is that you, uh, that the namespaces all don't, uh, that the literals don't have namespaces. So maybe it's a really good idea to define, to, to declare your operators in a custom namespace, and when you want to use them, you really import them explicitly because otherwise, if this technique becomes more common, you might have different implementations of common things like an UTF-8 literal or of a, a translation literal. This, you usually want to use short suffixes for convenience. This is a convenience feature, so maybe please do that if you implement that. So, I hope I've convinced you to use that ni really nice feature in your libraries in the future so that I don't have to need many sticky notes and to figure out what I'm really passing to the APIs. Thank you. And <laughs>